What are the variables or the frameworks that you have to help train those of us who not, are not so easily able to see the long term? Because in the variables that you were weighing in your stories, you meant you mentioned like compensation. You were you've taken pay cuts at several stages. So three times. Three major, times. major pay cuts. Major pay cuts. So what was the trade off that you saw and that you made in the moment that you're like, this is the right thing to do? So the, the two frameworks I would think about, one is one we actually apply to our investment decisions at Sequoia. It's a, a framework we use with our companies as they do annual planning and do strategic planning, which is the pre-mortem pre-parade framework. Hmm. And I actually got this from Larry Summers. He's hmm. on the board with me at Block, formerly known as Square. And the idea is literally write down in five years time, what's the pre-mortem, not, a, not the post-mortem, the pre-mortem. Hmm. Things didn't work out. What happened? And then you run a pre-parade, everything has gone swimmingly well. What exactly led to that? Mm -hmm. And it's really clarifying to, to make prioritization decisions, making sure you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. we've, we've applied it to ourselves at Sequoia. Never mind using it for investment memos when you make a new investment. We ourselves, a couple of years ago, did a 2030. Mm -hmm. And literally, the, the, the one slide was autopsy, 2030. Mm -hmm. Patient, Sequoia Capital. <laughs> what went wrong? That's bleak. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's incredibly focusing. And what we yeah. what we did at that one, for what it's worth, is we had every member of the team write a pre-mortem and a pre-parade, and then we anonymized them. Mm. And then we circulated it for everybody to read because we want the triumph of ideas, not the triumph of seniority, to help mm. us focus on the things that matter. And so for us, for example, the need to double down on our seed investing business, the need to build far greater capabilities and technology to help us build, you know, what is it going to, take to be one of the best venture firms in the world in 2030. Mm. It just seems incredibly clarifying when you take such a long range view and work backwards. Sure. Um, so it's much, and that's maybe part of the essence is, you know, forcing that long term framework and working backwards makes you realize that the steps you're taking don't lead to that outcome. Mm. So that's the one thing to do. You've got to ask yourself, if that's what I think my pre-parade is in five years, are the things I'm prioritizing this week leading me to that outcome or not? Are they the correct milestones to be looking for? And is this going to lead to that ball? So, so that's the one framework is for yourself. Think about a pre-parade, uh, pre-mortem. So when I was thinking about joining Sequoia Capital, my choices were I stay at PayPal. I'm the CFO. Meg Whitman has said that if I do well, maybe I can become the CEO of PayPal, a division of eBay. And that would lead to a, a series maybe that I, maybe I would lead PayPal. Maybe I could take a general management position in a different business down the road. So that was one set of possibilities. And the other one was at Sequoia where wow, isn't it incredible to be able to invest in such a broad range of companies and technologies? Mm. I'd be the novice. I was the most junior person at Sequoia Capital. I was at the bottom of the totem pole um, and I had to learn everything. Mm -hmm. Super intimidating. But if that worked out, wouldn't it be super interesting? Mm. How many interesting companies and technologies would I you know, get to learn about? And, that's, and if it worked out financially, I would do well in either situation, honestly. I don't think it materially changes where I'd live and the vacations I would take or the car I would drive, does it really make a difference? Probably mm. not, but this felt like a much more interesting career long-term. Mm. And so that led to that decision. So that's the one framework. Um, I'd say the other one is this idea of um, options. What leads to more options and what closes options? Mm -hmm. What opens doors and, and which decisions close doors? Mm. So if you buy, you know, I think of a lot of my classmates, took a very conservative decision right out of business school. But now you go from being, say, 28 at graduation. Now you're 30, 32, and you've made a series of safe choices in the first few years after business school. Does that lead to more interesting possibilities or are you closed off possibilities? Mm -hmm. And maybe you pursue something entrepreneurial and maybe it doesn't work out. But what does that lead to? Because life is a series of decisions. And I think a lot of people focus too much on the incremental one-time decision. Mm -hmm. you know, so if I gave you a dice and said, roll the dice and your life depended on six coming up, that'd be a scary proposition. But I said, yeah, 10 rolls. Mm. Pretty good chance six is going to come up once, probably twice mm -hmm. in that series. And so I think people worry too much about the next decision and they fret that this, this decision might not work out. But that's not the question. The question is, think about a decade of decisions mm. or two decades of decisions. And so if you do something entrepreneurial, who would you meet? Who are the interesting people you're going to come across? What are you going to learn about business that you might otherwise not learn if you're in a bigger corporation and you're you know, a cog in a machine? Mm -hmm. 
And so I just think that's a very useful framework for people. So are you opening doors or closing doors? Opening possibilities, closing possibilities.